Good morning, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. We invite you to take your seats so that we may commence our session soon. I would like to welcome the distinguished dignitaries, His Excellency, Mr. Wijawat Isara Bhakti, Special Envoy of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Thailand, Mr. Kave Zahidi, Deputy Executive Secretary of ESCAP, Mr. Jorge Chediak, Envoy of United Nations Secretary General on Social Cooperation and Director of United Nations Office on Social Cooperation to give their opening remarks and invite them to take their seats at the podium. We begin our session today with the opening remarks of Mr. Kave Zahidi, Deputy Executive Secretary of ESCAP. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Vijabat Isarab Hakti, Special Envoy of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Thailand. Your Excellency, Mr. Jorge Chediek, Special Envoy of the United Nations Secretary General on South-South Cooperation and Director of the UN Office of South-South Cooperation. Excellencies, Ministers, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this regional consultation on South-South Cooperation in Asia and the Pacific towards the Buenos Aires Plan of Action 40th Anniversary. We are very much delighted to be co-hosting this event with the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation and with the Royal Thai Government. The Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, ESCAP, has facilitated South-South and Triangular Cooperation for the past 70 years. Some would say that ESCAP was founded on the basis of South-South Cooperation to support the region's countries and economies transition from conflict to development. South-South cooperation has therefore been central to the support that we have provided to our member states to overcome development challenges across sectors and across borders. South-South and triangular cooperation has driven much of our technical assistance. It has informed our analysis and underpinned much of our intergovernmental work. It has helped strengthen regional cooperation, and in doing so, powered trade, foreign direct investment, technology transfer, and growth. Allow me to give you just a few examples. ESCAP's South-South Cooperation has strengthened information sharing and early warning systems to guard against natural disasters and build resilience in one of the most vulnerable parts of the world. Through its Regional Space Applications Program for Sustainable Development, known as RESAP, we have promoted the application of space technology and geographic information systems for disaster risk reduction and inclusive sustainable development. Similarly, the Typhoon Committee has enabled the sharing of experiences among countries on multi-hazard early warning systems and contributed significantly and substantially to reducing typhoon-related deaths in Asia over the past half century. Similarly, ESCAP's South-South and Triangular Cooperation initiatives have helped improve and integrate transport infrastructure, including through the Asian highways, the Trans-Asian Railway, 
and our recent efforts of sharing best practices in planning and design and development and operation of dry ports. Our capacity development programs, often delivered through the SCAP institutes, have promoted south-south exchanges of agricultural mechanization and machinery, of technology transfer, of ICT for development, and data and statistics. They have broadened regional trade and investment research and the knowledge base, including through the Asia-Pacific Research and Training Network on Trade, or ARTNET. These are just a few of the successes of which we are extremely proud and successes on which we wish to build. That's why South-South and Triangular Cooperation is very much at the heart of our push to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in Asia and the Pacific. This cooperation will be a cornerstone for our collective implementation of the regional roadmap for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, an agenda that is very much in step with Thailand's efforts to achieve a sufficiency economy. Our Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development, or the APFSD, provides the perfect opportunity to share good practices and exchange experiences on South-South cooperation in the context of the 2030 Agenda and for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Looking to the future, Asia-Pacific's mix of international development cooperation players is really a major asset for us. From large emerging economies like China and India, to high-income assistance providers like Japan, to middle-income countries, which are increasingly active donors and technical cooperation providers, there is enormous potential for stronger South-South cooperation within Asia-Pacific. Cooperation, which could be especially beneficial to our countries with special needs. But also, much more broadly, including to ASEAN, matching very much the universality of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Here at ESCAP, we are very proud and very keen to work with all our partners to achieve just that and to make the most of the funding available to support it. There are several South-South cooperation funds which the UN family and member states can tap. The United Nations Peace and Development Trust Fund, established with the support of China, has a sub-fund dedicated to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. The new India-UN Development Partnership Fund supports southern-led sustainable development projects across the developing world, with a focus on least developing countries and small island developing states. And there is the United Nations Fund on South-South Cooperation and the India, Brazil and South Africa Facility for Poverty and Hunger Alleviation. Recently, or more recently, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the New Development Bank also offer alternatives to the existing multilateral development bank scene. These mechanisms and these funding mechanism, mechanisms could help to bring about the step change needed in South-South cooperation in support of the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. Our ambition here over the next three days is to establish how, how we as UN agencies and governments can work together to make the most of these opportunities. We're very eager to hear your experiences as providers or as users of South-South and Triangular cooperation and to answer some key questions to guide us as we go forward. Questions like, what are the recent institutional arrangements and policies that actually have been successful within our regional context? How can we develop stronger partnerships with all interested parties, including civil society, think tanks, and the private sector? Is more needed to help our countries exchange good practices and coordinate the provision of the technical assistance to southern partners? For example, a regional forum on South-South and triangular cooperation in Asia and the Pacific, or a DG forum. Ladies and gentlemen, this regional consultation will very much help to shape our approach to the second United Nations high-level conference on South-South cooperation, the BAPA Plus 40 conference, as it's, as it's known, which will take place next March in Buenos Aires. It really is our opportunity to <clears throat> reinvigorate South-South and triangular cooperation in Asia and beyond. I'm looking forward to working with you to seize it and accelerate progress 
towards the 2030 agenda across our region and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Zahidi. I would now like to in invite Mr. Jorge Chadiek, Envoy of the United Nations Secretary General on South South Cooperation and Director of the United Nations Office on South South Cooperation to give his opening remarks. Thank you very much. Good morning. His Excellency, Mr. Vijavat Isarab Hakdi, Special Envoy of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Thailand, Mr. Kaveh Sahedi, Deputy Executive Secretary and Officer in Charge of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. 2015 was a critical year for the global community. In that year, the countries of the world got together and basically put together a new agenda, a new vision. A new vision that is articulated in some declarations and political statements like the Paris uh, Agreement on Climate Change, the SDG Agenda, and other thematic agreements. And it's an agenda that is, for the first time, comprehensive in the sense that it requires the engagement of all the nations in the world and also of all the individuals and communities to achieve those goals. And also it's an agenda that is not optional. Our patterns of production, consumption, social organization are not sustainable. Therefore, we need to change the way and the uh, direction of our global development processes. In that context, in all this, declarations and agreements, South-South cooperation was highlighted as a very important tool to achieve this collective vision. Remember, if we remember, South-South cooperation was born mostly as an expression of desire. Although ESCAP, which was not social at the time, in 1947 was created, as it was said very well, as a vehicle for South-South cooperation, at the time, and for many decades, we still expected the solutions to our development challenges to come from the experiences of the North. South-South cooperation, although politically it gained currency in Asia in the Bandung Conference in 1955, was still marginal in the global architecture. It was very important politically. It also resulted in more balanced political process in the United Nations with the creation in 64 of UNCTAD than the G77. But in reality, South-South was still a marginal component of the global cooperation structures. And it was, and it, which continued to be dominated by the resources, the visions, and the cultural parameters imposed or proposed by the northern countries. In 1974, my office was created. My office was created originally as TCDC, Technical Cooperation, among developing countries, to incorporate in the UN system, which was born as a vehicle for North-South cooperation, the idea that this I, collaboration among countries of the South could add value to our development efforts. In 1978, the countries of the world got together in my city of Buenos Aires, and we put together the countries of the world, the Buenos Aires Plan of Action, that established principles at the law, national, regional, interregional, and global level to create an architecture to ensure that technical cooperation among developing countries became a central component of the way we do development. It grew, but not as much. The real explosion of South-South cooperation, which was not South-South cooperation at the time of Buenos Aires. Remember, it was TCDC, then we had ECDC, 
This century, we, it became South-South Cooperation. At this century, it took off. It took off, one, because we had a lot of countries in the South achieving successes, showing that with their homegrown prescriptions and with their homegrown formulas, they could achieve great successes. And many of these countries were in this region, in Asia, in Asia Pacific. And also many countries of the South decided to commit resources to share their experiences. And we're very conscious how politically difficult it is in some of our countries where still we have serious social problems to address at the national level to commit resources to collaborate and to cooperate with others. But we are doing it. And I want to thank all the countries in this region, and there are many that are doing it with increasing intensity and with increasing commitment. So South-South cooperation became a very important element. And now that's why it was recognized in all these agendas as a central component of the new global architecture. In addition, until this century, we, it was a paradox. Most of the knowledge generated on the South had to be intermediated via the North. We did not have a lot of South-South exchanges at the scientific technological level or at the knowledge level. And now I see Professor Chaturvedi, and I remember last year in the Delhi, three, 41 think tanks of the South got together. That was not possible 20 years ago. First, there were not 41 think tanks of the South. And secondly, that meeting was probably taking place in The Hague or in London, because we could not organize it ourselves. So now we have the knowledge. We have the know-how. We have the self-confidence. And we have the resources to make South-South cooperation very important and very central. So that's why. The, uh, the international community, the General Assembly of the United Nations, decided to call for Buenos Aires Plus 40. To have it, as Dr. Sahedi said, as an opportunity to get basically bottom line more and better South-South and triangular cooperation. And I want to mention here triangular because also triangular cooperation was born in this region. Japan was a leading country in promoting this idea of having developed countries promote exchanges among countries of the South. So what are the challenges we have going towards the conference? You know, in New York, the political processes are very complicated. And some things that appear obvious in discussions here generate surprising pushback or generate uh, surprising unintended consequences related to other political processes, etc. So uh, to give you an idea, when the General Assembly passed the resolution, which is called the Modalities Resolution, calling for the conference, the countries could not agree on the themes of the conference that had to be approved in another resolution. That resolution was passed, and we have themes and sub-themes of the conference. And my office has been designated the secretariat of the preparatory process. If you knew me before, you will see I have more white hair than I had <laughs> about a year ago, and I lost some kilos, which is not that bad, but uh, is a result of the challenge of helping member states achieve that result of more and better South-South cooperation. And what are some of the challenges that we have? First, there is a great tension now with the traditional partners and the Southern partners. And how do we prepare an architecture that accommodate the different ways we do cooperation? What our partners for the North, from the North are saying is you have to adopt our architecture, the modalities we developed in the OECD DAC. And then 
in our, from our side, we end up saying in general, uh, no, we are not going to adopt any modalities. So that's where the debate is in New York today. Then how do we measure South-South cooperation? And believe me, I'm the first who say that it's probably the most cost-effective and the most efficient way of doing cooperation. But we make a mistake in many cases that we do not follow up, we do not report, and we do not show those results. And believe me, millions of people probably have left poverty, and millions of um, uh, enormous transformations were achieved with very small scale South-South cooperation initiatives. Also, another challenge is what do we do with the institutional framework to get more and better South-South cooperation? Dr. Sahedi mentioned the UN. How do we do a better job within the UN system to organize ourselves in a coordinated fashion to support more South-South cooperation? How do you utilize the network of inter sub-regional organizations and regional organizations. How can we utilize ASEAN, the Pacific Island Development Forum, and other entities to help do more better inter intra-regional and also inter-regional? Remember another of the points of Buenos Aires. How can we mobilize more resources for South-South cooperation? These are some of the challenges. I will mention some more when I become a panelist. But I want to tell you I came here primarily to listen. To listen because in the next month, my office will have to prepare a document that will serve member states as the guide for their discussions. I have been honored to participate in a similar meeting of, uh, in Latin America, in Cuba, in the context of ECLAC. Also an event in Africa with the African peer review mechanism. We're working with the African Union. We met with the developed countries. I went to the DAC. Some people thought I should have wore an, an armor or something. No, it was very civilized because I think we all to, we need to engage the partners because we think that this should be a win-win-win combination. All the parties have something to win. So if we manage to overcome some of the political challenges of the discussions, we should get more, as I said, better South-South and Triangular cooperation. So I want to thank ESCAP, the royal government of Thailand, who has been a great partner of our office. Actually, it's one of the, it was the first to follow up a explicit request from a resolution of the General Assembly that invites countries to second people to our office. Japan did it, but stopped doing it. Now Thailand came back, and we are very proud to have two members of the TICA team working in our office. Thank you. We invite other countries to do the same also, uh, because it is your office. So the stronger we are, the better it will be to provide services uh, to all of you. So really thank you to the government of Thailand for your leadership. So we look forward to learning from you, hearing from you, getting your ideas from the member states, from the United Nations family in the region. So we can help in our modest function as Secretariat of the Conference to make Buenos Aires uh, the place, the moment, the time where South-South cooperation became a central element of the global architecture to achieve this imperative agenda that we have to achieve, not for us who are here in the air-conditioned confines of this very beautiful building, but for the people who are out there who need it the most. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chadiek. I would now like to invite His Excellency, Mr. Wijawat Isarapakti, Special Envoy of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Thailand.
Mr. Kave Sahedi, Deputy Executive Secretary of SCAP. Mr. Jorge Shediak, Envoy of the United Nations Secretary General on South-South Cooperation and Director of UNOS. Your Excellency, Ms. Faustina Reue Marak, Minister of State of the Republic of Palau, distinguished representatives of member states of SCAP and the United Nations agencies, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Thailand, as well as the government and people of Thailand, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the regional consultation on South-South cooperation in Asia and the Pacific towards the Buenos Aires Plan of Action 40th anniversary. I am delighted to see so many of our colleagues from the region joining us today as part of the global preparatory processes leading to the second high-level United Nations Conference on South-South Cooperation, or in short, the BAPA Plus 40 Conference, to be held in Buenos Aires, Argentina, early next year. And I'm sure all of us are very much looking forward to this important event. Distinguished guests and participants, as the host country of the United Nations Regional Headquarters, and as a long-standing and committed member of the United Nations, Thailand is honored to co-host this important event, marking another important milestone for South-South cooperation and the global development cooperation architecture. Since the adoption of the Buenos Aires Plan of Action in 1978, South-South cooperation has expanded in both scope and scale. It has now evolved to include cooperation in nearly all aspects and areas of development, far beyond its initial recognition as technical cooperation. In close conjunction with triangular cooperation, which has already been mentioned this morning, the role of South-South cooperation has become increasingly important in pursuing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Hence, South-South cooperation is particularly relevant and significant for all of us, the countries of the Global South. It offers a unique development approach which allows developing countries to exchange experiences from our respective stages of development and socio-cultural and geographical backgrounds. It manifests solidarity amongst our peoples and countries and principles of respect for national ownership and independence, equality, non-conditionality, and mutual benefit. For decades, this one-of-a-kind cooperation has proven to yield relatively more adaptive, locally relevant, and cost-effective solutions. It is a significant and widely acknowledged complement to the traditional North-South cooperation. Distinguished guests and participants, the unprecedented growth in South-South cooperation lies in the recent rise of countries in the South. This is particularly evident in Asia, which has become a generating hub of diversified resources, new ideas, and practices for development. For the Asia-Pacific region, South-South cooperation has been one of the key instruments in fostering regional and sub-regional cooperation, a mechanism that has increasingly turned into a powerful platform for leveraging benefits for developing countries. More importantly, it has resulted in the increased volume of South-South engagements in the areas of trade and financial flows transfer of technology, as well as human resources development and capacity building. To support sustainability, South-South cooperation needs to be practical in both its practice and implementation. Following the example of many countries in the region, Thailand has progressed from being a recipient to becoming an aid provider or rather a partner in development cooperation. 
through the Thailand International Cooperation Agency, or TAICA, under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thailand has been working vigorously with more than 150 countries, of which countries of the South form a vast majority, as well as with development partners within South-South, North-South-South, and South-South for South modalities. At the heart of Thailand's development cooperation initiatives lies the practical application of the Sufficiency Economy Philosophy, or SEP, our homegrown approach to sustainable development, as articulated and bestowed by His Majesty the late King Pumipon Adunyadeh. It is one of the alternative approaches that we have been sharing with the region and the world, including through all possible modalities of South-South and triangular cooperation with partners from different regions of the globe. It is therefore our great pleasure to invite all of you on a field trip out of Bangkok tomorrow as we continue our regional consultation to experience firsthand the application of the sufficiency economy philosophy at the community level and in the form of an interactive museum. It will also be an excellent opportunity to exchange similar development experiences from different parts of the region and from different angles of sustainable development approaches that can be shared through South-South cooperation. Distinguished guests and participants, in the morning of 29th June 2018, which is day three of the conference, for the very first time in the Asia-Pacific region, a forum is being provided for heads of national agencies and government entities of the South who are responsible for development cooperation to share good practices and experiences in South-South and triangular cooperation and to coordinate technical cooperation between partner countries. We hope that this regional DG forum will provide some space for dialogue towards better coordination, coherence, and complementarity among ourselves in revisiting demands and directions, as well as delivering results-oriented development cooperation. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by stressing that achieving sustainable development for all cannot be undertaken by only a handful of committed countries. It requires a global partnership, which must take place at all levels and across all sectors. Whether it is North and South, developed and developing countries, recipients and providers of aid, all of these combinations, all of these partners have a vital role to play together. Despite the enormous progress made, South-South and triangular cooperation is admittedly not without its flaws, like any other development frameworks and approaches. And that is precisely the objective of our gathering here, to identify the remaining challenges, to leverage new and existing partnerships, and to enhance the potential of such cooperation through a higher level of coordination, coherence, and complementarity. I wish the consultation very fruitful discussions, an inspiring field visit tomorrow, and an innovative way forward for South-South and triangular cooperation. I thank you very much. Thank you, His Excellency, Mr. Rijawat. We have now come to the end of our opening session. I would like to invite all heads of delegations to join us outside in front of conference room three for our group photo. We also invite all participants to view our exhibition on good practices for South-South cooperation. This will be a good opportunity for exchanges of experiences. We shall resume at 10.30 a.m. Thank you.
Thank you. ไม่ได้ยากดิสคอนเนคกันโครงการกองศูนย์กระทรวงการต่างประเทศการพูดเพื่อประชาชนทุกแห่งบนดาวดูแล หนูอุ่นจื้นจ้านตอนที่หนึ่งพาสปอร์ตหายในต่างประเทศทำยังไงดีน้องแป้งนุ่มครับเรามาเซลฟี่หน้าหอไอเฟลกันเถอะช่ว
ASEAN connectivity will help us better work together on our common challenges. Our region needs a significant increase in infrastructure investments to meet our growing needs. 90 million more people will call our cities home by 2030. Productivity will also need to grow. We also need to cooperate to reach our full potential. Together, we form the third biggest workforce in the world and one of the world's biggest consumer markets. There is huge potential in our digital economy. Our economies are uniquely positioned to benefit further from global trade and investment. ASEAN connectivity will be enhanced through five strategic areas. Sustainable infrastructure, increasing investment, improving infrastructure productivity, and building better cities. Digital innovation, supporting adoption of technology, using digital innovations to improve financial access and enhance data sharing and management. Seamless logistics, lowering costs and improving supply chains. Regulatory excellence, providing common frameworks and removing trade barriers. People mobility, enhancing skills and enabling the movement of our most vital resource, the peoples of ASEAN. Through these areas, the Master Plan provides a framework for everyone to benefit and come closer together. The Master Plan for ASEAN Connectivity 2025, reaching for a better tomorrow by connecting ASEAN today. การพูดเพื่อประชาชนทุกแห่งหนเราดูแลหนูอุ่นจื้นจ้านตอนที่หนึ่งพาสปอร์ตหายในต่างประเทศทำยังไงดีน้องแป้งนุ่มครับเราม
The Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025 aims to secure a brighter future for the people of ASEAN. In the area of regulatory excellence and harmonizing regional standards, we will create an environment that better enables ASEAN to achieve sustained economic growth. For integration to take place, you need people movement, you need services to flow across the region. Strengthen regulatory excellence is for the countries to agree on adopting a common framework. Having a harmonized and a uniform set of regulatory standards will be good for the ASEAN uh, businesses and the other objective of course related to it is to reduce what is known as non-tariff measures or barriers. Despite considerable progress, there remains significant non-tariff trade barriers within ASEAN. The master plan lays out a strategy to address this challenge. It will increase transparency on such barriers and strengthen the evaluation of non-tariff measures by building on the ASEAN trade repository. The development of a trade regulation database will allow us to see how trade is regulated throughout ASEAN, help us access non-tariff trade barriers in greater detail and work towards removing these constraints on ASEAN trade. By bringing down barriers, we open up ASEAN to higher quality growth. In our SEZ, we have got a lot of non-tariff barriers that have been tremendously reduced uh, in many ways. One example is uh, the licensing systems. These licensing systems were never practiced in our SEZ. There is no price controls uh, in our SEZ and there is a level playing field that is fully assured by the law and there's no discrimination between foreign investors and domestic investors. Another example is we have established one-stop service centers at the SEZ and developed standard operating procedures to have the predictable environment for investors. The master plan will accelerate harmonization of standards and regulations within ASEAN by enhancing coordination between public and private stakeholders and promoting good regulatory practices. That means that products which comply with regulations in one ASEAN country will also comply with regulations in all other ASEAN countries. This will greatly improve the ease of doing business. And the easier it is to do business, the easier it is to invest in ASEAN. À, đặc biệt để thúc đẩy cái, cái cái công tác xuất nhập khẩu giữa các Việt Nam và các nước ASEAN à, trong thời gian qua và thời gian sắp tới đấy, thì chúng tôi cũng đã à, chủ động à, có cái sự kết nối à, các một cỡ một cửa ASEAN mục đích là những cái thông tin của các doanh nghiệp có thể là là thay vì phải tìm hiểu qua cái thủ tục thủ công thì chúng ta có thể trực tiếp tìm hiểu được cổng thông tin một cửa ASEAN này đó là vấn đề là thế quan à, mà các nước đã ký kết thì sẽ được à, giảm làm làm như vậy thì cái lượng hàng hóa của các nước ASEAN nó sẽ thúc đẩy và tạo thuận lợi hơn nữa à, trong cái thời gian tương lai tương lai. Harmonized regulation will have significant positive impacts on the micro, small and medium-sized enterprises at the heart of ASEAN's economy. It will improve transparency across borders, allowing even the smallest enterprise to trade efficiently over multiple territories, providing an environment that businesses in the region can thrive. Through all this, the Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025 will increase transparency, harmonize regulations and provide a stronger framework for economic collaboration in ASEAN. Working together towards a better connected ASEAN.